I'm Hugh Millward. I'm the developer of Warsome, the Realm of Aslona, which is a ASCII-based kingdom management game that's been in development for about five or six years and is somehow still going in 2021, bizarrely. How do you end up uh, working on a ASCII uh, kingdom management game in, for the last five years? Like, what's, what's your background in programming and design work? Yeah, it's really kind of an accident, to be honest. I don't think I would have chosen to be here if I had had a choice of being anywhere in the industry, but I, I'm I'm not upset about it either. I've always wanted to be a game developer. I always like it was it was a dream that I I felt was probably unattainable, to be honest. And uh, you know, I worked different jobs and did different things for quite a while. And I got kicked out of college, but I I really wanted to go in and do programming. And I ended up just learning it myself online. And I wasn't very good at it, but I was getting there. And I I. I tried a few little test projects here and there and one of them was an ASCII battle simulator where one set of units would go against another set of units it was immensely basic and once I finished making it I was like well maybe I should add like a little arena and some other stuff and I just kept adding little things to it and that lasted as like a little baby side project for about a year and I moved on came back did a few things here and there and after a little while I worked on a, a, a different similarly sort of testy project that almost felt like a game but still these are like sort of demo-y weird like builds of stuff that aren't really games and that project collapsed and I ended up sort of begrudgingly coming back to essentially war simulator project that I had going on and I kept on at that for another year or so and I think I shared it on reddit and itch.io and a couple of people downloaded it and played it I got some donations and things and I started feeling like actually this this could really be like a thing. This is kind of turning into a bit of a game. And so I started wrapping up some areas that were unfinished and adding new things, taking suggestions. And it was quite surprising as well how tone deaf I was in some areas. Um, So a lot of people pointed out different problems and issues and things I hadn't really considered with my dev goggles on. And I was able to, I guess, hone it to be a lot better with years and years of of suggestions and and, um, player feedback and stuff like that. And now five years on, for the last three years, I've been able to literally live on the income I've gotten from Steam from this game. Um, we sold maybe 26,000 copies, I think. Now, I, I, I'm not even sure exactly, but it passed 25,000 not too long ago. Um, it's got, um, I think, 450 reviews on Steam, um, just shy of getting the overwhelmingly positive tag. So like, it's going amazingly, but it was a total accident. A very bizarre situation. And it's an ASCII game, which... To be honest, it was only because it was all I could make at the time. And now, you know, I'd love to make a, a a game that I think could be more widely appealing potentially, although maybe not. Maybe it wouldn't be. I don't know. But it's it's probably not my chosen uh, chosen type of game, but I, I wouldn't change anything really. And I'm, I'm so glad to be able to do what I do. And I think I have an amazing community and so many like supportive and kind people who are involved in it. So the, the choice to go with ASCII was based on uh, like budget and time constraints then? <laughs> it was it was based on it was what I was learning to do at the time. And I never I never moved on aside from a few little forays into graphical development. I just got so stuck on this old ASCII project. I just kept adding things to it. And the feature creep really, really, really pushed me. And rather than letting the feature creep push me away from the project, I just tried to finish the features that had crept in and that just cascaded into five year, six year development. You know, here we are (laughs) still in early access. So I've got this question here and like after the hearing the the response to the last one, I'm not sure where you can go with this, but what are your main inspirations for working on a project like Warsim, like ASCII war game? Like you can play it with one hand on a numpad. Like (laughs) what do you kind of like, it's, it's kind of unique even within like, uh ascii and um like kingdom management games so like where do you draw inspirations to find new material for the game yeah it is it is a weird one i mean i'm quite inspired by games like dwarf fortress um i played that a lot way before i ever worked on war sim um but i think a lot of the mechanics within it as well i'm inspired by games like mountain blade um and and sort of elder scrolls series a lot of like amazing fantasy games that have left their impression on me over time um it's, it's kind of like a real mash of a lot of different ideas and things, to be honest, and then I guess my own flair. So War, War Sim seems to, or it seems to do a whole lot of under the hood generation, like while the player is just plucking away at keys. Um, the game manages to also feel quite simple to play, like it never, at least for me, felt overwhelming while seeming to have a large amount of depth. Uh, do you have any difficulty managing kind of that accessibility feeling while at the same time keeping the game feeling deep without feeling overwhelming 
Well, to be honest, it's, it's kind of a balancing act. I, I never really wanted anything to be too overwhelming because I think a lot of people will look at text-based and ASCII games and feel like they're just going to be overwhelmed the moment they start playing because they'll have to remember 50 different key presses and functions and all these different things. And I didn't want that because I know how that feels, like um, a gigantic learning curve. And sometimes when there is a gigantic learning curve to a game, it puts people off, but they miss an amazing game on the other side of that. In the case of things like Dwarf Fortress, a lot of people get scared off by that, but you know, it's an amazing game with so much to it behind the, the doors. And it's the same with so many uh, games, especially roguelikes and things like that, they, you know, where a lot of people don't really give them a, the time of day unless they're, they're polished up and they've got graphics and they look like any other game you'd see being released in the indie scene. Um, so I was trying my best to avoid um, really complicated um, sort of things like that. Um, but there is, I, 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 it's a balancing act that I think is helped by the fact that if anyone gets confused and there's an issue, it's usually commented on or reported on on Steam, Reddit, or one of the forums or Discord. Through that, I can identify sort of what's being confused and try my best to change that. And honestly, I probably had to make maybe 500 changes in regards to things that have been confusing or problematic that I've just not thought of yet. So it's a it's a constant battle, but it's it's worth it because obviously, you know, if one person has an issue with it, hundreds of people could and, and maybe aren't even saying anything. And it's, you know, as long as you can, as long as you're not, I guess, reducing what what the game is to make it accessible and to add all those sorts of things to it then i guess you know that works i'm any kind of accessibility and like uh ease of play in a ascii game i think is extremely important because in, in many ways i i've kind of started to look at it as almost like the anti-dwarf fortress where, where dwarf fortress is like this amazingly huge sprawling deep hard to learn game because of the the key combinations whereas war sim is like this oh, you need nine buttons and enter. <laughs> exactly, yeah. It's like numpad and oh. enter, which is, which is really neat at, that you've managed to pack so much into simply those nine buttons. Like it, it's 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 easier to play than Zork, which is <laughs> kind of crazy yeah, that... if you think about it. Um, so yeah. another thing that the game does is you're generating uh, visuals. You're, you're generating faces um, for your individual races. So I've got a few questions about faces here. Uh, the, the first one is um, there, there's a number, the number of faces in the game is bloody impressive. And uh, did, did you run into any challenges while divide, like uh, designing such large variety of visual face generations for the non-playable races? Yeah, it's it's you not. Know, it's a really basic system overall, and I think with that, there's been like a slight problem with with some things. But the way it works, um, it, th there's just seven layers essentially of of text. So there's a layer for the the top of the head, uh, a layer for like the eyebrow area, I guess, um, a layer for the eyes, a layer for the nose and ears, a layer for the upper lip, the mouth, and the chin. And basically, what the game does is it'll pick a random number between however many um, different types of each face part there are for the different races. And then we'll mash them all together. And obviously you're going to get a different face every time if there's a hundred different types of each one. And it really gets kind of stupid with the exponential like amounts of things that can be produced when you've got a hundred times a hundred times a hundred times a hundred times a hundred or something like that. You know, you end up in like the billions. So it almost feels like cheating sometimes saying that there is that much, but in reality, even if there was thousands of faces, no player is really going to probably see them all, but there are legitimately, I think, a few quadrillion maybe overall across the 40 or 50 different face generators, but it's a really basic system overall, and I'm, I'm so glad it works as well as it does really, all, all things considered. Um, but the issues that I have had with it are with hair, believe it or not. So I struggle to do um, female face generating for um, female characters that would have long hair because unless they all have exactly the same hairstyle, they would have to be lots of divergent systems for the different ways the hair would flow down each graphic. I know it's a really basic problem. I, I could probably sort it out if I gave it a bit of a thought and added an extra little thing in there, but I haven't tackled that one yet. <laughs> it's on my list. Oh, damn. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't I'd never like thought about the fact that m like most of the characters have minimal hair or it's like all on top of their head or like maybe in a turban type thing. <laughs> yeah. the, and then this is a question that I got about faces from chat quite a bit, which is does the visual generation of the face have any attachment to the faction stats whatsoever? Yes. So 
this this was something it's one of my favorite things about the game because i've been working on this game for years and i've been play testing it for years and i think for the first i mean every time i add a new feature it's it feels new and, and cool but otherwise after a f- after five years of constantly play testing it, it does get a little bit samey and it's like you know i think the throne room is quite different every time because there's about a thousand things that can happen and some of those are randomly generated but there are a lot of things in the game that aren't randomly generated and after you know a thousand hours of playing it some of those things I'm just skipping through. I don't really pay attention and I can't enjoy it as much. But one thing that I can enjoy is the the random race generation because I think there are 97 million. I'm not sure the exact number, but I think it's something about 97 million. And some of them vary in different ways. Some of them quite similar. And, you know, you could argue that they're barely different. But there are quite a lot of different effects that happen on different races that will change the way they're, the face generator functions. So, for example, um, you can get inbred dwarves so if a character gen- is generating a face for an inbred uh, character, it'll skip a random one of the seven face parts and remove it. So their face will be randomly deformed. Um, you can get things that add the- give them extra eyes or maybe no mouth or missing ears or maybe it'll give them six pairs of eyes and a massive head if they're monstrous creatures and stuff like that. And so what you end up with is usually some stuff that like I've never drawn them, I've never designed them but they get fed through this system that sort of creates stuff that I've never seen before. So it's, it's always exciting for me to see the sort of stuff that comes out. And there's been times where I've not really been paying attention and I've, I've been doing diplomacy with a random group and I've seen a face that has just caught me off guard because it's not something I've ever intended to create or designed and I'm being surprised by my own game. So yeah, it's it's definitely um, the, the random races, not all of them. Some of them will look the same as their like standard vanilla variant, but quite a few of them will have... Um, modifications on the the sort of way their face is generated that is really cool uh there, there's there's one of my favorite games for just well it's not really a game it's it's more of just a piece of software that is uh dressed up like a game but ultima ratio regum will oh is, yeah just generates everything and it's it's just so interesting walking around in that world and just like looking <laughs> it's like i it's the only <laughs> thing that's ever entertained me by just looking at tables like we're going from town yeah, to town man. and look at how they design their tables <laughs> it's just this i find it mind-boggling mind-blowing what they've done it's crazy what that thing is and uh the the faces that this that war sim manages to generate gives me a, a, a little feeling of that almost like it, it's partially because you just you don't see the same face twice really and also because it's just they they all look kind of unique and i'm always kind of hoping that like someone's going to come back to the throne room and i'm going to recognize them or like a knight <laughs> will come back and I'll be like oh i've seen you before that's that's cool <laughs> Um, so I, I, I really like the, the, the way the faces work. It, I think it's quite the achievement, to be honest. Um, and another thing that, 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 that uh, Warsim does that I think is really interesting and unique is the procedural songs. Like, Dwarf Fortress will <laughs> describe music to you, but, like, they can't show you the music, whereas you just actually have procedural music. So how did the procedural songs come about? And I I actually have quite a bit of musical training. I'm curious if they have any logic to them whatsoever or if they're just <laughs> random sounds. Yeah, I uh I mean, I wish I could claim that I've got some really advanced like programming that generates these amazing symph- symphonies, but like really it's just I think I was I was playing through some stuff at, at one point um earlier on in the development. And I really wanted to see if I could do sort of things like that with the with the random bards coming in and playing you their random songs. So I think at one point I grabbed my guitar and I recorded loads of different sounds of me like tapping on the guitar and any different kind of sound effect I could, random strings being plucked and stuff. And I tried to see what I could get out of it and it was kind of nonsensical. But originally the, I made the game just essentially pick one random sound off uh, uh, after the other. And so obviously it's just chaotic random sound effects. Um, and then after a while, I, I added some alternate systems where it'll play two or three of the same note and then move on to another random note and play that. But it's not really ever anything amazing. It's usually just a couple of sounds slapped together in one sort of style or the other. Um, and then the differences are how fast w- the note moves from one note to the next. So um, the bards will have different levels of skill. And if their skill is really low, then the next note will come really slowly. And if they're really talented, the notes will come really quickly. So the song will be played faster. And I think there's actually, um, there's an uh, an item called the Musician's Elixir, which can be bought in the black market. And if you've got your own uh, throne room bard, you can buy the elixir for them, give it to them, and they'll play at like the maximum speed possible. It's just absolute chaos. It's just like a crazy, like weird sound that goes really fast. 
And I think the the character will just say something like, I feel so powerful. And it's just like this crazy sound thing that comes through. But yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not the most amazing system. I think it's just, it's more amusing to be honest than anything. Um, although I think it's, it's grown a bit thin on me over the years, but every, every I do enjoy I the, a, the bards. Every time I see a bard come in, I, I will listen to their music and <laughs> insult them because it's great. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, where, where did the idea for the mini games come in? Well, do you know, it's, it's kind of like what War Sims about really. Like I, the, the main point, I know, I mean, I started the game not really with any sort of ideas, but after a while, I, I played a lot of kingdom management games and a lot of games where you're someone in a really big position of power in like a fantasy world. And I feel like the options you're given on on how you choose to rule and what you choose to do are really kind of small. Like if I'm the ruler of a kingdom, I don't necessarily want to just make decisions about, you know, policy and upgrades and, you know, looking after the things. Maybe I want to get really drunk and I don't know, go bet the kingdom's gold on a scorpion fight in a far off area of the world or you know go do something else and get drunk in a vampire city and declare war on them and do do like really stupid things that are unrelated and have fun uh so i added basically every place i could go i was trying to think of ways to to make it fun and and i think all in all there's there's maybe about 20 different mini games that can be played from snail racing to there's a game called biggle roll you can play in this like cave gnome village uh, there's a bunch of different random games. There's, um, I think, uh, I think it's a game called Sudden Death, and there's four variants of that. There's, a, there's a lot of different things, but just everything I could add to to make things feel more, more like you're going to a place where you can do things. Like the black market is probably my favorite location for the ability to get lost in, for example. Because um, when I first made it, it was it was one single flat area with three or four things you could do in it. And I, I remember reading this, um, I think it's a fighting fantasy book. It's one of those like choose your own adventure books where oh, yeah. it's like turn to page 10, turn to page whatever. And there was one of these books where you're you're in this like mystical market of medieval fantasy. And every corner you go, you don't know what you're going to encounter. There's, you know, people doing competitions. There's a house full of goblins. There's all sorts of crazy shit going on. And um, I, I really wanted to capture that somehow. Um but a page where there's, there's four areas, you can see exactly what's going on. You know, go into this building, go into this building. It didn't really feel like you could get lost in it. So I tried to build the black market, for example, on, on that sort of idea of there's so many different places in there. There's I think there's easily a hundred different things you can do in the black market and they can change and there's all sorts of different crap going on to the point where you could get lost in it. I'd imagine most people don't fully explore everything in there because it's too much. Um, so it's more just making it so that the game focus doesn't just have to be on like raw kingdom management and you can actually rule like I guess a real ruler would. Most of the time they're not doing anything that's looking out for the benefits of the kingdom. Usually it's enjoying the position they're in, you know what I mean? So listening to your description of the game, um and and knowing that there's a few overhaul mods just like packed in, I'm sitting here going, someone needs to make a Yakuza mod because I think <laughs> like that translates perfectly. Um <laughs> So the, the the next question I have is uh like what's it like marketing an ASCII kingdom sim? S- Steam is crowded as hell. Like what do you think makes it stand out? Yeah, it's 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 a difficult time I think overall. I mean, I didn't realize before getting into this. I mean, as soon as it was put on Steam, I submitted it to um I think it was Steam Greenlight at the time. And I submitted it to Greenlight as a joke because I was like, there's no way this is going to go through, but I'm going to pay this this money and I'm going to submit it through because if I don't, I'll kick myself. Um, but if it goes through, you know, happy days. And I didn't expect anything of it. I was like, there's, they're not going to, you know, it's not getting that many thumbs up. Um, there's so many projects that I'm competing with that are going to be greenlit and mine's going to fall to the wayside. But um, they, they let it through. And after that, I think the initial sales of it being a new game that people could see... Um, there, there was quite a few copies being sold. I think a couple of hundred every every week, which was amazing for me. It was mind blowing. I'd never had that many in. I've, I think I'd sold probably twenty copies on itch.io prior to that. Um, well, donations, I guess, because it was free at the time. But it, I never expected anything like that, and it kept going. And then it sort of leveled out a little bit. And after the first like few months on Steam, it it, it died down completely. And I realized that I'd probably need to start doing some kind of marketing. So. I, I tried to do as much research as I could, um, and I figured there's hundreds of different things that you can do. You can send, you know, copies to people who are um, playing games within your genre that have any kind of influence on people, and hope that maybe if they check it out, other people will, 
you know, see the game and, and follow through to it that way. I mean, I guess kind of like you, for example, do you know what I mean? Like you play the game and, and people who've watched your streams do end up buying, buying the game, it, whether it's 10 people or 100 people, it does have an effect. And obviously, you know, the more the more contacting you do and the more you can get it out there, that helps. I think if you can get any kind of media attention, that obviously makes a difference, I believe. But I've never really, uh, I've never had any mainstream gaming media cover it. Um, uh, but I've had some times where reasonably sized YouTubers have checked it out and I've seen a pretty noticeable bump. Uh, I've tried writing articles. I, I find Reddit is actually really interesting. I think I'm lucky because I've been on Reddit for a long time. So I understand how to like share things on Reddit without being spammy. Whereas I guess some people just go paste a few links around and you're going to get, you know, in a lot of trouble and going to get a lot of flack for it. Um, so I, I went through Reddit. I found a list of hundreds and hundreds of different subreddits and tried to identify, you know, what I could post and where I could post it and stuff like that. And over the years, I've tried so many different things with varied success, but I'm managing to survive and live on uh, the income from Warsim. So I, I I definitely don't feel like I'm unsuccessful, but it, obviously it can always be better. And I'm always I'm always open to more ways of getting it out to more people. Um, so my plan is once it's uh, released from early access finally, which at this rate probably is going to be maybe more than a year from now, who knows, could be even longer. Um, I've got a lot of plans for things I'm going to do then. And I've been building this like scrapbook essentially of all my different ideas of ways I can market it and try and get it out there. So, um, but, but I'm not going to be stopping working on Warsim even once it's out of early access. I will continue to update it as regularly as I can find time to do because I've got thousands of things on a to-do list for this game. What are your future plans for Warsim and will it be finished or rather what will it look like when it's finished? Yeah, no, I wish I knew, honestly. Um, I mean, I if I look back years ago and I tried to estimate what I thought Warsim would have looked like by the end, it wouldn't have been anything like it is now because it is shaped quite a lot by what people suggest and what people come up with. And I've had like quite a few ideas that have come from, I mean, the throne room was added in on a whim, for example, that was not ever a planned part of the game. I played something that I think it was called Sort the Court, which is a, an itch.io game that was up for free. It was kind of like Reigns, um, the sort of card game kingdom management thing, but it was way before Reigns. And I played it. I thought this is a pretty cool concept and I'd like to do something kind of like this in uh, in Warsim. And I made that. And there's so many things like that have cropped up and just become part of the game and changed it and added to it. And there's, I think at this point, there's maybe 500 to 1,000 things, um, mostly player suggestions, but also my own ideas on this list that I'm working through. Um, at the moment, I'm trying to rework how the combat works um, because it's probably one of the oldest parts of the game. And it's and for a war simulator, it's not, not the best part, really. And uh, I want to change it up. So I'm trying to work on that at the moment. I think that's going to take me quite a few months. Um, but I reckon maybe a year or two and I could probably have this game finished. Um, and after that, I, I mean, I don't know. I guess it's already kind of finished now, to be honest. I think there's not really maybe an area or two that are a bit empty or unfinished, but otherwise the vast majority of the game functions and you can play through full scenarios and hundreds of years. And there's, you know, countless different things that will happen and lots of content. But obviously there's still things that I would like to change and add. And, and even when I'm trying to be aware of the feature creep, I think I've still got so much that I feel like is kind of essential to add um, that I'm going to be on this for a little while. But it's, it's hard to call really what it'll look like at the end. Hopefully better than it is now. <laughs> I mean, currently, I, I, if you were to release the game out of early access the way it currently sits with the last 15 hours I've put into it, I, yeah, I, I would feel it would be a fair ask where it currently is. But, you know, with stuff like that, you can always plug in more. So why not if you can? Exactly. Um, but to kind of on, like, I guess talking about feature creep and this ever-growing list of features as, as a final question, um, is there something you would do differently uh, if you were developing war sim again like if you were starting over knowing what you know now what would you have done differently so many things to be honest like <laughs> i mean i really like where it's gone and i pre like it was never where i intended it to go and I it's better than i wanted it to be but i think if i'd known where i was planning on taking it from the start i could have done things differently from the very beginning that would have made it easier and allowed me to do certain things in a much better way um, and i think i've also got um, like, for example, the independent kingdoms in your world. So every different game spawns with five different um, independent kingdoms that are of the 97 million random races. And it's always five different ones every time you play, and that's fun or whatever. But it would be really cool if, for example, you could have a custom game where maybe you've got only one independent kingdom, or maybe you've got 10 or 100. But the game is hard-coded always to have five independent kingdoms and a bunch of other factions that are always there. And... Um, I would really have loved to have gone back and not built it originally so hard-codedly so that there could be a much more 
random and procedural way things could have gone. Um, and that is something that I wish I could do now, but I think it would require practically an overwriting of the whole game. And at this point, I think we're talking half a million lines of code. It'd be a lot of work, but yeah. I mean, there's, there's lots of other things as well. Uh, little things that I know I would be able to do better if I originally made the game in a different way. But I think I'm managing with how it is now. But pretty much everything probably would be slightly different, at least. Live and learn. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm more or less out of questions at this <laughs> point. So I'm just going to give you the floor and just say, tell people where they can find and purchase WarSim and where they can help you out and support the game. I appreciate that. So um, WarSim's on, on Steam as WarSim, the realm of Azlona. Um, you can find it on HIO as well. Um, and there's a community on Reddit, Steam, Discord, uh, loads of different places. But anyone who checks out the game, if you've got any any questions at all listening to this that you want to ask me, I'm always open to reply to anything. Um, I'm always interested in people that are interested in something I've created. You know, it means a lot to me. So, you know, any questions that weren't answered on this, don't hesitate. And thank you very much for taking the time to join me and have a little chat. Oh, I appreciate it, man. And cheers to you, mate. And of course, thank you very much you for taking the time to join me. Thank you very much for listening to this interview to anybody out there in the world who did. And uh, if you want more stuff like this, I'm open to it. It's not the easiest thing for me to put together and organize, but it's here. So if, if this is something that you want to see more of on the YouTube channel, I used to do this stuff quite a lot with an old group that I used to work with, but don't anymore. Uh, so I, I would be keen to do more of this, not super frequently, because the amount of legwork I have to actually do to get these done is kind of pretty high. So uh, thank you very much to everybody who watched this interview. And uh, if you want the audio version that is available on my Patreon, or of course, you know, you can use one of the various means to download the YouTube video in audio format. And uh, if you'd like to support me and my work over here on this weird YouTube channel, you can, and uh, my weird Twitch streams, you can do that down in my Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash B-L-I-N-D-I-R-L. Please go support Warsim. It's a cool fucking game. And thank you very much for hanging out. And I'll see you in the next one.